Welcome back again with the uh, Blue Review, uh, episode 88. Um, today I'm going to talk about Dexter New Blood, aka Dexter Season 9. Um, this was a 10 part limited series event on Showtime, uh, which I think was conceived that way after the success of the 2017 Twin Peaks The Return. Uh, the 18 episode limited series event, uh, which is probably my favorite thing that David Lynch has directed ever. Uh, probably the greatest TV uh, season ever filmed. I know, hyperbole, but that's okay. Everyone knows I'm a, a Peaks freak, so to speak. So, um, Dexter was a big fan of the old series. I talked briefly about him. Uh, probably an unrelated tangent on one of my recent videos, and I mentioned I was watching the series as it unfolded. So, uh, so yeah, so let's get into it here. So, 10 episodes, 10 one-hour episodes. Um, this aired, I believe, every Sunday uh, on Showtime. Uh, I watched it on a Plex, uh, Plex uh, site, uh, my good friend Dwayne Cochran. You know what's coming. Dwayne Cochran. Uh, hooked me up with a Plex account a few years ago. So as he adds titles, you know, I'm able to view them for free. And a lot of times it's stuff, not Dexter, but stuff that's more mainstream that I normally uh, would not pay money to watch, but I might be marginally curious about. Uh, so that's helped me a lot. Some gaps in my uh, movie, movie and TV knowledge. Um, something we can all work on. Um, so Dexter, I was a big fan of the old series. Uh, I already talked about my experiences with Dexter in another video. So if you didn't see that video, I don't know what to say. I can't remember exactly what video it was, but I'm not going to re regurgitate that here. Um, but I was a fan. Uh, it was one of my very favorite shows of all time. Uh, it was probably maybe in my top 25 or something like that. I'm, just saying. Uh, I'm having some lighting weirdness here, and it's really grainy. More than usual, it's always kind of grainy, and I usually like that. Uh, but this is kind of, I don't know, sometimes I look even a little too pale for me, and I'm very pale. So, in any case, uh, I didn't know what to expect of the new Dexter show. I just knew Michael C. Hall was going to play Dexter Morgan again. Uh, they didn't announce that anyone else was returning. Uh, close to the airing, they announced that Jennifer Carpenter would somehow reprise the role of Deborah Morgan, who died in the last episode of the original series, season eight, final episode, season finale. Um, you may remember, if you follow Dexter at all or read about it, that Dexter uh, really kind of was painted into a corner by his actions and his lifestyle, I guess you could say. You know, he's a serial killer, but he is a vigilante. He's not just like a wanton serial killer. Uh, he doesn't prey on the innocent. He kind of administers justice. Uh, something that the lines were kind of blurry in the old series, but now in hindsight, I guess as pop culture has changed and popular cultural perceptions have changed now, um, in the new series when referring to his previous actions, he is defined more by the characters uh, and, and it's the writers and the audience, I guess, by extension, as a vigilante. Strictly as just a serial killer, but that's the challenge that the writers have set up in the new series is what are the distinctions and what's the law, what's justice, what's warranted, what's not warranted. I, in a way, it goes a little deeper in these core concerns than the whole series was because the whole series, the old series, was predicated on, a, on that idea, but the engine to me that drove it was Dexter's urges and how he was able to channel them uh, via this code that his uh, adopted father, Harry Morgan, played by the great James Ramar, instilled in him from a young age when he began exhibiting these uh, violent tendencies. So um, that was kind of the chief thing. And also, first law rule of the code was don't get caught. So the problem is over seven and eight seasons, it became more and more difficult. Dexter's... Uh, it, People, became, people came closer and closer to finding out. So a lot of the suspense of that series was who's going to find out, when are they going to find out, how are they going to react, and will he be made to pay for his crimes legally? 
And the thing is, he worked as a <laughs> blood spatter analyst uh, with the forensics department of the Miami Metro Police Department. So, yeah, he's, he's kind of hiding in plain sight. So early in the series, in order to evade capture and, and handle this ongoing problem, was he framed a uh, co-worker, uh, James Stokes, who was, um, you know, slightly older than him, maybe, yeah, slightly older than him, maybe around his age, uh, African-American officer who was very kind of mean, kind of mean and tough, and uh, he had worked in covert ops, like black ops in the military, a violent guy with a bad temper, but a good heart, apparently, at least according to his sometime lover, uh, Maria LaGuardia, who ended up becoming the police chief in the series. Um, I don't think she was the police chief at first. I can't remember that character's name, but, um, but, uh, you know, he successfully framed Dokes as the guy who had been killing these wanted criminals and chopping them up, putting them in garbage bags and sinking them in the ocean and acquire, you know, this acquire, um, thus the serial killer responsible acquired the name the Bay Harbor Butcher. Um, and so he framed Dokes as the Bay Harbor Butcher, and then Dokes died in an explosion. And see, the thing is, it's been a while since I've watched some of these episodes, even though several of them I watched more than once. And I can't remember if Dexter engineer No, Dexter didn't kill Dokes. I think there was a woman named Lila, maybe? Diana, Lila. I can't remember what she was see, like some kind of admirer of Dexter, some kind of psychotic personage who took care of Dokes. So Dexter didn't have to do that. And then, therefore, he didn't break the code because the other part of the code was, you know, only people who deserve it. And as the series went on, especially toward the end, he grappled with that. Like, his temper would get the best of him. Uh, there was a guy who was fucking around with Deb, his sister. After Deborah finally found out he was the Bay Harbor Butcher, and accepted him, even though she freaked her out. And she kind of agreed to keep his secret as long as he would stay on the certain path. It, it was a big change in the show. It came late in the game. and But in the way it was acted and directed, it seemed natural. Even though Deborah seemed like she was uh, dead, she was always kind of poised, maybe on the edge of trying to force Dexter to turn himself in. Um but anyway, like, she had a guy she was fucking around briefly, and some conflict ensued. Dexter stabbed him to death, right, in the living room. And it was like, whoa, okay, so he's going outside. Admittedly, it was self-defense, but he's going, like, outside of the code now. I mean, he's just, like, brutally killing someone when provoked. Um, So he started to go off the path, and he started to doubt Harry, his stepfather, and the whole code thing, because, A, he learned that Harry killed himself because he couldn't handle... I guess the monster he created with Dexter. And then he found out that uh, Harry didn't actually devise the code, that it was a woman named Evelyn Bogle, played by the great Charlotte Rampling. Uh, and she was like a psychologist or whatever that I think Harry took Dexter to as a kid. So she helped create Dexter too. So she was kind of an ally of Dexter, but then she got murdered, I think right in front of Dexter, by another killer. And that's another theme in the new show, uh, is that whoever gets close to Dex, not just people who learn the truth or get in the way, but people who are close to him in any way, like his family, friends, lovers, whatever, they end up dying because of what he does. Uh, this is embodied and personified in the new show by the re reappearing um, Jennifer Carpenter as Deborah Morgan. And of course, she's a ghost or a figment in his mind. It's like a part of his conscience of his old self. Uh, because if she died, too, as a consequence of Dexter's actions, he did not kill her, though. But the ghost of Deb more or less says, you killed me. You're responsible for my death. Um, in the old show, he would talk to Harry, his father, the deceased adopted father's ghost or visions or whatever. I saw this really stupid article, and yeah, big surprise here, Screen Rant. I don't even know why I click on them anymore, because that's all they're there for is clickbait, literally. Because you click on them and you're like, oh, wow, I just learned something I already knew. And I was just exposed to an opinion about it that was utterly unformed and wrongheaded and mean-spirited and stupid. And that's basically what they function as. Sometimes they have some good news ahead of other people, but then you read the article and you're like, okay, I just wanted the news. I don't want this fan bro telling me how I need to 
hate the show or this character or whatever because some lame brain reason that they just thought up like you know in their own like headcanon fanfic fantasy world um but that's kind of what i got with uh this article about dexter it was like now we know the truth about those appearances of of harry in the old series i'm like we already knew the truth and so it goes into it it's like we realized from Deborah's appearances in the new series that in the old series, Harry was just a figment of Dexter's imagination in his mind. He wasn't really there. Now at last, we've kn- and I'm like, dude, I knew that from the first episode Harry ever appeared. The problem with, the problem with uh, sites like Screen Rant and their writers is that they think linearly, they think everything has to be spelled out for the viewer, the viewer is not capable of intuiting the uh, author's intentions uh, by the work itself, or in the case of cinema or TV, through the visual cues or the visual information given. You know, uh, everything has to be dumbed down and like spelled out, and that's why you have so many of these sites and these fan, uh, so many chunks of fandom that are like, that's what really happened because it didn't explicitly say it didn't happen. So consequently, in Twin Peaks, you watch the show and you're on his current, P, uh, Frost's and Lynch's current, and you've seen the old material and you understand the context. So you immediately, you're able to go, wow. And every week you were able to do this with the return because there were no spoilers. Lynch signed all these non-disclosure forms. Everyone did involved. So it was an unprecedented experience like when my generation was kids and you had no clue what was going to happen the next day on a soap opera or the next week on a TV show. Um, and that's what happened. Literally no one knew until they watched it live, not live, like filmed live, but live as it, as it was premiering that specific night of the week. And so I would connect and I go, Oh wow. This, yeah. And then I talked with friends and we, uh, we got it, you know, but then I started looking at twin peaks, uh, fan groups on Facebook and a lot of them got it too, but a lot of them were fan bros and they were like, well, this actually meant that because this didn't actually mean that, and, you know, and I had to quit like five of them by the end of that series. By the time it played out, I quit most of my groups I was in because it was saturated with basically people writing their own fanfic about what they insisted actually happened, which ran totally counter what I saw with my own physical senses. So this that's what Screen Rant does, and that's kind of what they do with this Dexter article. Sorry about that rant. Any opportunity I get, I'll slag the fan bro clickbait sites. You know that about me. I'm sorry. It's a pet peeve of mine. And I doubt that's going to go away as long as they exist. Um, I just try to avoid reading I shouldn't have looked at it. I'd been good. I hadn't looked at Screen Rants. Actually, tried to read an article in months. Uh, ever since they told me I needed to hate. I'd already quit, but okay, uh, I did weaken and read something about Titans Season 3 because it seemed to be some information I, I wanted to know. And once again, I was... The clickbait, I was sucked in, I fell for it, and it was like, they basically spent all articles like this long uh, telling me why I should hate Titan Season 3, and every episode is an utter failure uh, and crap, you know, and that's what their articles do. Um, that's the rant for another, yet another video. Um, so anyway, that's what Deborah does in this season, she kind of hectors on Dexter to keep him on the path because he's moved away. Now he moved like, to the Pacific Northwest, I think, at the end of the last series. He ends up in a cabin in the woods. And he's like a lumberjack or something. And a lot of people hated that ending. I was indifferent. I didn't love it or hate it. I didn't like it or dislike it. I was just, well, Dexter's painting himself in the corner because, like I said, at first he took care of Dokes. He ended up telling Deborah and she didn't turn him in. But LaGuardia found out and started, you know, stalking him, trying to get him, bring him to justice, because she didn't think James Stokes was capable of this. Um, and, see, I can't remember if he killed her or not. This is a point they bring up in the new show toward the end of it is, somehow I think he was somehow responsible for her death. Like, he would manipulate circumstances to where people who were on to him uh, would kind of get taken care of. Or... The writers would do that. You know, like, oh, Dexter's about to get caught. Like, Dexter was about to get caught, I think, by Frank Lundy, played by the great Keith Carradine, who was an FBI agent who was brought in on the Trinity Killer case, which was in a whole season arc of Dexter. Don't ask me what number season. 
Um, the Trinity Killer was played by John Lithgow, and he was incredible. Um, that was probably the most popular season in Dexter's history with fans, from what I can discern. And uh, yeah, I love Keith Carradine, and of course he became Deb's lover, which was great. As you guys know from other videos, I love the the I don't know what months, May December. That's not it, but you know, much older guy, younger woman, because you know that's kind of <laughs> happens to me a lot. Some of my parents were. Uh, you know, there's a romance to it. I know it's kind of taboo in the current generation. But I assure you, nobody, my, me or my dad, ever slept with was under 21 when I was uh, over 21. Okay, one, when I was young, I was 23 and she was 17. Okay, right. But again, this was a long, long time ago. Uh, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't do that now. Um, well, it's different. That was only eight years difference, I think. Seven, six, seven years different. Now that's irrelevant. My ex-wife was eight years younger than me. Uh, but she was in her 30s when we got married. So, but I liked that. That was the Keith Carradine, Jennifer Carpenter. I, I just, I liked it. It was well played. And they talked a lot about the age to cultural differences. And it was romantic. But unfortunately, Lundy ran afoul of the Trinity Killer. And I don't think he figured out who Dexter was. But I think what it was is he was getting close to hitting the Trinity Killer. And Dexter made this stupid mistake. He decided he was going to fuck with the Trinity Killer. Like, you know, because he killed in, I'm trying to think of the term they use in the show <clears throat> and what profilers use, I think it's sounders or sound, is that right? Basically like patterns, like time patterns, like say he kills three people in a week, then waits three months. That was basically kind of, Trinity was kind of numerological, like a lot of serial killers have been, like a Zodiac killer. Um, it was real life, um, in real life, but it never caught. Um, but that's how the Trinity Killer operated, and Dexter was basically using the time between the two kill sprees to kind of fuck with him, like infiltrate his life, string him along, and in a way, learn from him, and I guess empathize with him almost, and he was fascinated with him, so he's playing kind of a cat and mouse, but predicated on the hope that Trinity, Arthur Mitchell, would never find out that his friend Kyle was really Dexter Morgan, a, a a police, you know, forensics expert, um, much less a serial killer or a vigilante. Um, and it went on for a while. And unfortunately, because of that, of him not homing in on Trinity when he had the chance, Trinity began killing uh, to cover his tracks the way Dexter was forced to, except Trinity didn't actually do the killing. He, uh, his daughter did it for him. He had an older daughter from an earlier marriage, and she knew who he was, and in order to protect him, she killed other people who weren't part of his, you know, trinity pattern. And the thing is, he, ended, he hated her, actually, and resented her existence. And that's, other than him stalking around doing his serial killer preparations, you only saw the part of Arthur Mitchell that was this good guy guy who was a church guy and a family guy. But when you he engaged with his disowned daughter, you saw that just evil, mean, impatient part of him rise to the fore and you saw what it, and then later he treated his own actual family that way and one of his family sided with Kyle Dexter against him and then of course once the cat was out of the bag between them you know he killed Dexter's wife before Dexter knew about it anticipating of Dexter catching and killing him which he did now this season repeats that story pattern oh uh, you have a killer um I don't think the killer has a name as a killer but it was a, a guy named Kurt Caldwell played by Clancy Brown. And Kurt Caldwell's like this rich motherfucker who's lived in Iron Lake, upstate New York, which is now where Dexter's live, uh, settled after years out in the Northwest. And it's still kind of a off the beam track. It, I mean, this takes place in December as it aired in December. Kind of like Hawkeye was a Christmas show, so is Dexter. Kind of like Spider Man No Way Home was a, a Christmas, was, yeah, it was a Christmas movie too. Um, so, hold on, I'm going to pause this, and I'm going to take care of something in the back. I hope I don't end the video. I'll be back. I have returned. Calm down, I'm back, but don't get too excited. So, this is the deal. Um, this season, like I said, has a trendy killer like killer with Kurt Caldwell, played by the great Clancy Brown. So, anyway, Kurt, uh, Kurt um, Dexter uh, now lives in this place called Iron Lake, a fictional uh northern upstate new york you know this time of year frozen snowy mountainous wilderness kind of region small town 
he's been there indeterminate amount of years, probably not very long, um, not that many years. So when we come upon him as the story opens, the season opens, he's dating the police chief, Angela Bishop, who is a Native American. There's a big Native American presence and population there. And one of her ongoing concerns is that uh, a lot of runaways who come through Iron Lake on the way to the big city or wherever uh, have gone missing in that area over a course of quite a number of years. And a number of them have been Native American, not, not most, a lot of them Caucasian also. And uh, she's never been able to solve it or tie them all together. So uh, early in the show, well, in the first episode, I believe Dexter hasn't killed in 10 years. Uh, he's kind of finally learned how to at least mimic social interaction. It's seemingly something he finally succeeded at over the course of his original series, which in the beginning of the series, he wasn't too keen on. He just enough to kind of pass as human, so to speak. Um, he's better than that now. And, and he's gotten over his kind of weird thing with women. I guess he'd gotten over by the time he got with Hannah at the end of the old series. Um, he's actually kind of sort of able to have a relationship and sort of able to reveal who he was um, within it. Because like I said, Trinity killer, Arthur Bishop, did kill his ex-wife, Rita. Rita he didn't really love, but he kind of had to blend in. And they did have a kid, Harrison. He did care about Harrison. Um, I think he cared more at Harrison than he realized, though. And, and that kind of changed something in Dexter. But he abandoned Harrison in the old series, left her with Hannah, him with Hannah, and went out and faked his death in the hurricane, even though she knew he was going to fake his death and he was alive. Problem is, she never told Harrison. They moved to Argentina, and she raised Harrison. And the new series, uh, like I said, the new series opens, and one guy in town he doesn't like is this character named Matt Caldwell, who's this 20-something spoiled rich asshole cunt who kind of like gets, has literally gotten away with murder in his reckless life style. And... Dexter kills him, like for old time's sake. Now, along the way, the ghost of Deborah is trying to stop him, and she's really mean and talking shit to him and you know, guilt tripping him, like, you got me killed, look at what you did. She's very hard on him the whole season. I mean, she only has a little kindness toward him at the very last episode or two. Uh, but she's really kind of there to scold him. It's his guilt. Like, don't go off this path. Stay on this path, because everyone you love will die, which I covered earlier. So he kills Matt. And the main reason he kills Matt is kind of reflexive, too. I mean, he doesn't reflexively kill him like the self-defense thing I pointed out earlier. But he reflexively decides to kill Matt. He hated Matt. But then Matt kills this beautiful white deer who was a protected endangered species on the native land. And Dexter found the white deer, and they had a bond. I don't know, it's intense. It's wild. And being an animal person myself, I thought this gave another element to Dexter that was really cool. And that he has more empathy in the few minutes with this animal, as he called it, this beautiful, majestic creature, than he ever did with any humans. And then right in front of him, the deer's killed by a gloating Matt, who thinks it's like cool and macho, you know. And uh, Dexter kills him. And then he sets up his new killing room. That's when he decides to do the whole, go the whole nine yards. Uh, he takes him there. He doesn't kill him then and there. He knocks him out. So he does it, and... He gets rid of his body. He burns it. Problem is, the guy's had some kind of surgery, and he's got these titanium steel things holding his hip together. You won't know until we know that kind of. We don't know for sure until many episodes, several episodes later, that the titanium rod survived the fire. Um, that's crucial. Um, anyway, we do get introduced to his asshole father, Kurt Clancy Brown, who's this blustering, weird, rich fucking guy. He's real friendly. A little too friendly to everybody and generous. Everybody's buddy, everybody's big brother, big papa. Uh, but he's furious about Matt, and uh, there's no sign of Matt. And the theory is since he killed a, a protected animal on native land, that he left town rather than be arrested. And Dexter does what he can to nudge Angela, his girlfriend, in the direction. I was going to say this about Angela is right, like he kind of perfected the relationship thing somewhat with Hannah. So Angela seems to have a pretty normal normal relationship. A lot of sex and kindness and also, again, hiding in plain sight, keeping him under the radar. 
So in a way, he's using her too. But he, he genuinely seems to love her, not in an intense, deep way, uh, but as much of a romantic love as he's capable of. Uh, briefly predicated on security, safety, sex, comfort, you know, and, and that fits in with this life he's tried to make for himself now. Um, so Kurt won't take no for an answer when they can't find Matt, and then Kurt fabricates this story that he's talked to Matt on the phone, and Matt was at this uh, hotel in New York, which turns out later to be a total lie. Dexter thinks he's on to me. Much later, we find out, yes, he's on to him, and he's been on him because he found the he found the nail, the, uh, the rods, the titanium rods. It tells Dexter a bit later, toward the end of the show, uh, titanium doesn't burn. Um... So he embarks on this, we don't know exactly, this is his motive at the time, but he embarks on this plan to snare Dexter's son, Harrison. Now, Harrison has, uh, I haven't mentioned him before in, in this series, uh, he's one of the few returning characters, albeit played by an, uh, not an adult, but like, well, the character's about 15 years old, maybe 16 of the oldest, um, but I, I'm sure the actor's a little older. So he's a more grown-up version. The last guy we saw playing was probably five years old, so at the oldest, so... Um, so anyway, but a returning character nonetheless, and he has been on a journey from Argentina to find him because Hannah died of cancer, and Dexter first denies that he's Dexter Morgan. He goes by the name Jim Lindsay, which is an homage to the creator of Dexter, Jeff Lindsay, who wrote the Dexter books. Um, so brushes Harrison off. Then when Harrison's about to leave, Dexter comes around. And Dexter reveals, yes, I am Dexter Morgan. Makes them some lies to cover why he left, saying kind of he'd had it after Deborah died and after Rita had been killed by the Trinity Killer, too much death. Doesn't still wash with Harrison. Harrison has years of resentment and anger and confusion built up. Um, and then later, finally, Angela pieces it together. Um, and she confronts him. Now, he explains the same thing to her, his story. Uh, she doesn't like it, though. She breaks up with Dexter. Dexter apparently forgets this, because Dexter still, after things start really accelerating plot-wise with Kurt, um, Dexter still assumes she's his girlfriend, even though they haven't really gotten back together, which is stupid, because he kind of walks into a lot of problems. Um, and again, there are the recurring ideas. He had... He, overreacts, he's starting to lose control like he did at the end of the original series, kill when he doesn't need to kill, and do anything he can to cover himself because the truth is coming close to being revealed. Um, speaking of the truth, so Kurt Caldwell is, is deduced by Dexter and Angela to be the guy who killed all these runaways. Uh, we finally see, we see hints throughout the first few episodes, and then finally we do see him capturing a girl, spying on her in this cabin headquarters he has stashed away and finally killing her on camera basically shooting her in the face and he's real fucked up he's real OCD and then he does this ritual on their bodies surgical like embalming kind of we don't see all of it I little bit we see like part of it on camera what he's doing almost like a surgeon or a coroner we don't really see till near the end of the show what he's actually wrought um, it's pretty grisly so uh, good old Dexter so, yeah, the truth is closing in on everybody, Kurt and on Dexter. So, again, it's like Trinity is a cat and mouse, and he's got to play, you know, these two are playing against each other. Now, Now Kurt doesn't have any idea Dexter was ever a serial killer vigilante, or Dexter. He just thinks Jim Lindsay, A, deserves to die because he killed his son, uh, and B, because, so, you know, he knows Dexter's at least capable of murder, but also he just, you know, fucking with him, the manipulation... So his answer is to become close to Harrison, and since Harrison feels abandoned emotionally now, in addition to having been previously physically abandoned by his dad, uh, Harrison looks up to Gert. No, God knows why, but again, he's a young, confused, messed up teenager. He's fighting his own urges of violence, and that plays out in different ways. His only sympathetic ear really is Angela's adopted daughter, um, who... Uh, yeah, she's not her real biological daughter. Ironically, though, well, the character is part Native American. She's just not Angela's biological daughter. Um, she was her stepdaughter and then adopted daughter. 
Um, but in, actually, the actress who plays the daughter uh, is also part Native American. But unlike, uh, I think her name is Julia Jones, who plays Angela. Julia Jones is noticeably Amerind, as they used to say, Native American, American Indian. Um, her daughter, hang on her name, her daughter's character's name. Ah, uh, the daughter, um, yeah, she doesn't look Native American at all, but, but the character and the actress are part Native American. So I like that angle. I, I like all that. Being part Native American, I, I dig that element of stories all the time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big part. I'm slightly more than Elizabeth Warren, but I like her. I would never claim it, much less to get special treatment at school. <laughs> Screw that lady. So, um, so the thing is, those are the elements in play. And so towards the, uh, episodes eight and nine, it all starts to unravel. Kurt becomes more vile and bonkers. And then finally tries to kill Harrison. Dexter saves him. Uh, Dexter kills one of his accomplices. I uh, was tasked with hunting Dexter. And his character's name is Elric Kane, which is funny. I mean, because Elric, I'm like, other than the Michael Moorcock character, I don't know of any people that I've ever met named Elric. And it's E-L-R-I-C, but that's cool, Elric Kane. Kind of wastes a cool name on a kind of a stupid, dumb character. Um, but it's okay. Just an homage, I guess. So... After he kills that redneck guy because the redneck guy detained him from saving his son from Kurt. So Dex, his son knows the deal with Kurt. And finally, Dexter tells him the truth, most of it. Uh, that he's had these violent urges. He tells him about the code. He tells him everything short of the fact he actually murders these people and hacks them up. And because the ghost of Deb chastises him. And it's really a beautiful scene at the end of episode nine because kid hugs him and it, I cried a little bit. I was like, wow. And, and Dexter's like, you know, he, Dexter's still doing the voiceover. Michael C. Hall is doing Dexter's thoughts as we go along and reaction to things and in the time they're happening. And one of these, this is all I ever wanted. And I was kind of reminded of the end of the Hannibal series where, you know, bloodied and exhausted, half dead, Will and uh, Hannibal after dispatching the, the red dragon, Francis Dolorhide, uh, you know, Hannibal says, this is all I ever wanted for you, for us. And Will's like, it's beautiful. And they topple off the cliff hugging. Oh, wow, what an ending. Um, that was a show that, <laughs> that was a show I got my ex-fiance into. And it was a show, it was my, it was the favorite show of Ann Meliora, my last girlfriend. So we talked a lot about that stuff. So and she'd be like, there are days when I'm not sure what I want to watch. So for comfort, I just, put on Dexter, the entire series, and watch it yet again. I mean, I've seen the whole series all the way through three or four times. I think four times. But she's seen the whole series way more than me. She couldn't come to an exact number. I miss her. So anyway, um, all the elements are in place. The last episode, uh, Angela is starting to figure out who Dexter is. I mean, really is. And... Uh, she starts to deduce he is indeed the Bay Harbor Butcher. And a lot of this is spurred by this um, podcaster um, named, I think her name's Kim, is that right? And she is a, an Asian American character. Uh, and she's kind of got a potty mouth. She's a trip. She's very hyper and egotistical, a lot of personality. First, she's a little dislikable, and then she becomes a little more likable. But she loves Angela, and they try to solve the kidnappings uh, of the runaway, deaths of the runaways, missing the runaways. Uh, and she also tries to figure out the thing with Kurt Caldwell. And actually, Dexter saves her from very deliberately from falling into his path as his next victim because he sees her as a threat. And, and Dexter actually saves her because he's thinking of killing her because he thinks she told Angela that he's really Dexter Morgan, but that wasn't true. Um, it was actually a slip of the tongue by an inebriated Harrison to Audrey. Audrey's the daughter. And Audrey told Angela, and Angela just did an internet search of his face, and then boom, you know. Uh, we've had a couple of spot appearances by Batista, one of the few surviving uh, characters from the original series. He appears in one episode at a like symposium on crime, serial killers, I don't know. He talks about the Bay Harbor Butcher a little. He meets Angela and Kim. And uh, so she calls him again and sees uh, episode 10, the last episode. And she's like, you know, it kind of, they make the connections together that, 
you know, I think I found the Bay Har- real Bay Harbor butcher. And he says, yes, Mike's wife. Oop, I mean, uh, police chief, which she was both. LaGuardia died. Well, he's like, she thought, um, she thought that it wasn't actually James. She's like, well, who did she think it is? And he said, well, I don't know. She started to suspect our forensics guy, Dexter Morgan, but then she died. And then Dexter died. She's like, how did she die? And then she's like, um, and now she sends him a picture of her and Dexter. He goes, when was this taken? She's like, a week ago. And he's like, I would be there tomorrow, you know. So you figure, okay, Dexter's fucked by tomorrow. Dexter's going to meet Batista again. It's all over. So as it is, Angela arrests him for the murder of Matt Caldwell because Kurt is dispatched by Dexter. Uh, and and um, I, I had my episodes wrong, by the way. The end of episode eight is where Dexter and, uh, tells his son, I've had violent urges, and he saves him from Kurt. Episode nine is where uh, they dispatch good old Kurt. And by that time, of course, he tells the full truth. He ignores the ghost of Deb, tells the full truth to his son that he did kill them. And his son seems to be cool with it. Like, he, like wow, you're a vigilante like Batman. And he's flattering Dexter, and Dexter's ego kind of gets to him. And then Dexter's ears are grinding like the old Dexter. Like, you know, how do I get away? How do I keep doing this stuff? And he's like, let's leave town together. He's like, but I don't want to leave my friends and Audrey. But he decides to do it finally, because finally him and his dad love each other. They're bonded. And they seem to be on the same wavelength, right? Don't trust it. I mean, I wasn't sure to trust it. I mean, I wouldn't know what... Dexter gets sloppy, though. He's so now infatuated with the idea of now I can go on the run again, and but my son's with me, and now I finally love... Wow. And Deb taunts him with this, like, you love every minute of this, you don't care about what's good for him, and, you know, she's been trying to keep him from telling Kurt the truth, I mean, Kurt, and Harrison the truth, and she find, he finally does. So, it doesn't end well. Uh, while Dexter's detained for the murder of Matt Caldwell, Kurt sent a note, it was kind of like Trinity again, like, you know, before I go out, if I go out, I'm gonna fuck this guy. So he actually sent Angela the titanium seal, and she anxious to tell Dexter, yeah, titanium doesn't burn, and his voiceover is like, yes, as I'm well aware now, and she, he pretty much diverts all the attention to Kurt, uh, and now when him and Harrison killed uh, Kurt, he made the killing table in Kurt's cabin where underground, it's real kind of like a villain's lair. He's got this elaborate setup where he was doing these kind of operations, uh, repairs on people, embalming, uh, and that is what he was doing. And he's got this kind of hall of trophies, and basically they're the whole, they're the women. All of them naked, preserved, perfectly, just kind of standing there in these glass things, one after another. And, the, you know, Angela, when she finally discovers it, I guesstimates there's about 30 women, which there may well be, but he's, you know, mathematically... Kurt has to have killed more people than Dexter, and Dexter said his were in the hundreds. And the showrunner said the official count is 135 to 157 when the show starts. So, you know, 30 is kind of slim for 25 years of Kurt killing. Uh, and by this time, you know, Kurt did get arrested for killing Angela's best friend 25 years. And we see a flashback, even though Kurt tells a lie and blames his father. But uh, we see a flashback where young Kurt, different actor, kills her, Iris best friend of, of Angela back in the 90s. So we kind of see the scope of what he's done when they kill him on that. They kill him with his, you know, trophy chamber. Kind of reminds me of uh, the Black Cat where Boris, uh, Boris Karloff as uh, Pelzig has reserved um, uh, Vetus, Vetus Vertigas' wife that he had an affair with um, in this glass case, and she hasn't physically changed since World War One. And then he's sleeping with the daughter of that woman, and Vernagast, you know, it's pretty gross and fucked up, but that movie's gross and fucked up, but in an awesome way, I love the black cat. Um, so it's kind of like that, and so Kurt, of course, is like talks smack to them before he dies and taunts them, and he kills, they kill him, that's that. 
And Dex, uh, Harrison's a little freaked out, but he's still kind of with it. He thinks Kurt deserved to die, and it's pretty cool when they team up and get Kurt. But unfortunately, like I said, in season 10, Angela does arrest him for the murder of uh, Matt, and Dexter diverts the attention to Kurt, tells Angela where to find this morbid chamber where all the bodies are. And she goes, but she's torn because she really wants to take down Dexter. She hates Dexter. She definitely has no more feelings of love or caring for him whatsoever. It's very antagonistic. Uh, and she's basically like, you know, I'm going to take care of this, but then you're going to fucking, you'll get off for Matt, but you're going to fry for the Bay Harbor Butcher. Because she knows Batista's coming the next day and the gig's up. So Dexter's like, now we need to leave earlier than planned, Harrison. Um, and that's what they decide to do. But once again, Dexter freaks out. He, he's impatient. He's, his self-preservation mode kicks in and turns to violence. I mean, what if he was released from jail before Batista came? Then him and Harrison could have got away. They put him in a window. But he doesn't wait. So he just call, you know, he tells Harrison, meet me at such and such, where I saw the white deer. And Harrison does, and and his plan is to grab uh, Logan, who's his friend and Harrison's coach in school. Um, this nice uh, guy, he's like the deputy. He's a black guy. He's sometimes dim about things. And then a lot of times he has a big heart. He's really a good guy, actually. I wasn't sure how I felt about him at first, but he actually is a great guy. And he's like, don't move. I'm just going to take your keys. I'm going to get with my son. Uh, get with my son and... Well, you know, he tries to get the gun and pulls it back and the gun goes off and so he's already got him through the bars. Dexter snaps Logan's neck and kills him. And of course, he's got his little voice to every, you know, I told you it would have been okay. Why'd you have to do that? But really no remorse whatsoever. And this guy was a good friend of his. And that's when we see Dexter shifting back into this mode. And that's how things unravel because he meets Harrison and they're going to skip out before Angela gets to them because Angela's wrapping up the thing with, you know, realizing Kurt's the killer of all these girls. Uh, and and Harrison's like, uh, what's that blood? Is that your blood? He's like, no. And she's like, you called from Coach's phone. What? He's like, is that Logan's blood? He's like, I'm sorry. I'll tell you everything. I had to kill him. I had, you know, he didn't pay. He didn't listen to me. We had to go forward with the plan. Let's go. There's not much time. He's out of breath, and finally, you know, Harrison gets the rifle. He gave him a rifle for Christmas. Uh, and, um, you know, once again, Dexter is on a, I ran out of options. He's in a, he's cornered like he was last season. So finally he's like, you know, he wants Harrison to go with him, and then finally he's like, okay, well, I'm going to go by myself. So, wow. You know, he's lapsed totally into that mode. There's no more Deb talking to him. Uh, and Harrison's like, hold on, and he threatens to shoot him, and then finally Dexter's like, you can just, you know, this is the best way for both of us. And Harrison shoots him in the in the heart, it looks like, and he dies pretty quick. Uh, and then Angela, I knew Angela was going to come upon them then. I knew it was going to be four, you know, I didn't know Dexter was going to die, but at that point I'm thinking he probably will die. I've heard the rumor that he was going to die, but then a lot of fans were like, no, he can't die. And so I thought, they probably won't kill him, but yeah, Dexter dies. Big spoiler! So the extra dies, and um, Angela comes upon Harrison, and she's got all this money and stuff that Kurt, she confiscated from Kurt's house, because Kurt was going to leave town right before uh, they killed him, because they found him out. You know, they found his lair. Um, and she gives the money to Harrison. It's like, can I talk to Audrey? She's like, no, because I didn't see you. If you don't go now, it's not going to work. Just go now, make a new life. Uh, and he, he, you know, lingers on Dexter and then just splits in the truck and with the money and Dexter's laying there and Angela doesn't seem too aggrieved about it. Uh, I don't expect her to. I'm just saying, wow, you know. Um, so here again, the conflict between the law and justice. It's inevitable. So once she chose the law, see, she was after Kurt until he could legally get off of killing Iris. And then she didn't even think he was a suspect anymore for anything. That's just how her brain works. And so once she found out that Dexter could be the Bay Harbor Butcher or killed Matt, she just hates him because he broke the law. So it's not really about justice, whereas that's what it's about for, for Dexter. 
mostly it's about that way for Harrison. Really about justice. Dexter it is, but it's also in Dexter's mind. It's about fulfilling his urges and escaping, not being caught, the number one rule. And now finally this is undoing. He jumps the gun literally with Logan and then boom, you know, um, his number's up and we see the ghost of Deb lingering in his corpse. And she's calm. She's not all hyped up and mean. She looks really sad. But also, I guess, probably thinking, hey, man, you're with me now, bro. And Dexter's, I mean, Dexter. Harrison's on the highway playing music, and he starts to smile, and it's weird. I don't know. I guess he feels free. I mean, they kind of cover this between their dialogue and Dexter's voiceover. And then, basically, the voiceover all the way through that sequence is, uh, Michael C. Hall reading the letter, which we've heard excerpts from before, the letter that he wrote Hannah to keep, um, you know, to, to follow the instructions to raise um, Harrison because he was going to fake his death and leave. Um, I don't remember if the, the letter was done in voiceover or shown in the last episode of the original series. It could have been. I don't remember, though. But it is in this, and, and he reads enough to where basically he says, you know, and he means it in the sense of faking his death, but he basically, you know, he says, the only way for Harrison to live, you know, is for me to die. And that's it. Woo! So there are no more Dexter. And I really hope they don't do a Harrison show. I don't think Harrison's going to choose that path. That seems to be the strong implication. There's not going to be an Angela show either. Julia, Julia Jones is gorgeous, though. Good actor. I never, I never wasn't familiar with her. Um... I don't know how I feel about the ending. I just kind of accept it for what it is because like the original series, what direction can you go? Dexter's made it clear time and time again. And he even mentions it vehemently to the ghost of Deb. I think in episode nine, that prison, you wanted me to go to prison. And it reminds me again of a scene in Hannibal where Hannibal's like, you know, you, you would begrudge me my life. You would deny me my life. And, and Will's like, no, not your life. He's like my freedom then. It would have me rot in prison, you know, and that's that engine in those the way that some of these killers think is like, I'll never go to prison. They'll never catch me. No matter what, whether it's the right thing to do, wrong thing. I'll never trust the system. And I mean, why would the, well, a guy like Hannibal, the system shouldn't be just to someone like him. But Dexter, should they be just to him? Well, they're never going to redefine the law and, and justice as being the same thing. So. So no, you know, ju their justice is a different thing. I mean, it's not karmic. It's kind of egalitarian. Like, a, it's not an eye for an eye. It's like, you know, take every eye. Actually, it is like an eye for an eye, but it's reversed. In other words, well, you killed someone. It doesn't matter why you killed them, how you killed them, you know, or they deserve to die. Now you will die. And, you know, they, they were taught, you know, D'Angelo wanted him to be extradited to Miami. For the Bay Harbor Butcher crimes and to face the death penalty. And she was pretty damn happy about it. He wasn't. I <laughs> understandably. Again, a lot of this is there. The material's there in front of you. I'm inferring things. I'm reading between the lines. But I hope that it's been informed uh, by my experiences with the old series. My own feelings about law and justice. Um, you know other texts like Hannibal and stuff like that I keep referring to about serial killers and then texts about vigilantes like Batman they keep referring to in the show. So I think that's where Dexter neatly, Dexter New Blood neatly fits in that niche. I just can't tell you that I have an emotional response to the end because I don't. I mean, for a split second, I was kind of like, oh man, they're going to kill Dexter. But to be honest, I think the main flaw with the last episode, if there was a flaw, it was a little directed, a little flat. It was powerful, but it was so subdued, kind of. And it was inevitable. Um, but, you know, Thanos was inevitable, too, and that was still pretty fucking dramatic in the Infinity War. Um, this wasn't dramatic like Hannibal, the last episode. It, it didn't have that. Maybe it wasn't trying. I mean, maybe it's a different kind of show. Maybe it isn't trying to be as artistic or have these these grand flourishes or, you know, filigree. Um and that's fine. You know, I don't think Hannibal was pretentious, though. Don't get me wrong. Very artistic and, and grand and emotionally doesn't necessarily mean it's 
doesn't necessarily mean that it is pompous and pretentious. Some people think that about stuff like Infinity War, and I get that too, though they resonate with me personally. Um, but I understand. Um, Dexter was low key, and maybe it was just a hair too low key. I don't know. So I haven't talked to anybody about it who's watched it. I don't think any of my friends. Close friends have either watched it all or finished it yet. Um, when they do, uh, it's stuff I'd like to talk about. So, uh, like I said in one of my, our previous video, I'm just finding out how many people either have never seen the original series or are not familiar with it and or just don't give a fuck and are not interested. And that's cool. Um, I get it. It's not as bad as Twin Peaks. More people I know have seen Dexter than have seen Twin Peaks. And the people who aren't interested in or don't give a fuck about Twin Peaks, man, you don't, who needs that kind of negativity in their world? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, if you're interested in film and the artistry of storytelling and things that are interesting to watch and, and, and essential uh, from a cinematic point of view, an artistic point of view, enriching, challenging, I think between Dexter and Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks is vastly more essential than Dexter. Um, Hannibal lies kind of in the middle, though, of course, it's aspiring to Twin Peaks. If somebody said Hannibal or Dexter, I'd be like, Hannibal, I wouldn't even think, I wouldn't even consider Dexter. Now, mind you, and I'm going to fade out here in a sec, the, Dexter, I still put head and shoulders above like 90% of the <clears throat> serial killer pop culture texts that have been out. Um, I would say in a way I put Dexter above Silence of the Lambs, the movie, for instance, and definitely above that Red Dragon movie. Uh, Manhunter, I don't know, par with Manhunter, almost. But then you get into Hannibal's show, and you're like, now we're on another level. So, And after I went back and read the key Thomas Harris books, uh, I think the seeds are there in those books for the greatness uh, that I think made Manhunter and Sansa Lambs popular, the films. Uh, the Red Dragon movie didn't didn't get those seeds, didn't cultivate them or nurture them. Um, but the Hannibal series, they, they blossom, and you go, wow. Not only do they fulfill the potential in the books, but in some ways exceed them, uh, with the exception of the book Hannibal. The book Hannibal, unlike the other uh, texts about Hannibal Lecter by Thomas Harris, the book Hannibal is a bit more avant-garde. It's sort of a bit higher level of literature. And I know a lot of people are going to take issue with that, people who love Hannibal, the other books are going to take issue with. They're like, why are you dissing the Sons of the Lambs book? Hannibal ain't all that. Or there are people who hate the books and like, fuck Hannibal. It's just like those shitty other ones. And a lot of the people who read Hannibal when it came out thought that too. They're like, fuck this weird shit. Why is she, why is Clarice getting with Hannibal? This is sickening. Um, but you know what? They all bought it and read it anyway and made Harris richer. But Harris had a contract. Uh, it's not that he didn't have anything left to say about Hannibal. It's that he was obliged to do it, and he knew he was going to get rich doing it anyway. So anyway, I'm sorry I talk so fast sometimes. So why not just go out there? Let's t let's get into the the uh, what's the place called? I should know by now. Jeez, the Memory Hall, the Memory Museum, or the Mind Museum? Oh my brain, the Memory Palace. Is that it? Oh, that's incredible. So anyway, I'm going to sign off. I'm trying to do some more videos tonight, but I don't know when I'll post them, but I'm going to post them. this a ASAP. Sorry it's so long. I'm trying to strive for under 45-minute videos now, but at least I'm in an hour. Take care. Rock on.